But please ask for questions in the Because I understand it very well, but I'm not sure. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. What I'm going to talk to you about is what I have started to call the flower of evolution. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, Darwin uh, said that organisms evolved as species evolved, but most of the time he he approached evolution as something that occurs at the organismal level. Now, in the introduction of the modern synthesis and the recognition that organisms are brought forth by genes, uh, people start to look into below organismal levels of evolution and above organismal levels of evolution. And so microevolution then associates with gene theories, mesoevolution with the evo devo evolutionary developmental biology, organismal points of view. And then um, uh, what you don't see here on the, the far right um, is... Um, I wonder if I can move this. Yes, I can. So what you see here is macroevolution, which is evolution at the species level or above the species level. Uh, and then in recent years, um, debate has arisen again within evolutionary biology about whether or not evolutionary biology is complete as we know it, as defined by the modern synthesis and these three schools. And so scholars have said that we need to extend the evolutionary synthesis. And that is debates that associate with questions about the nature of reticulate evolution and of ecology. And um, um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that this structure is a theoretical way of thinking about how evolutionary, how the, what the evolution of evolutionary thinking is. 
but it would be wrong to understand this as phase one, two, three, because this is absolutely not the case, because especially the ideas of reticulate evolution and ecology actually precede the modern synthesis, and actually some of them also precede the introduction of evolution by means of uh, natural selection as introduced by Darwin. So these are actually older schools that are being reinterpreted uh, today based upon uh, existing knowledge. And so um, now I have to move this again. Um, okay. So um, one of the things that, that uh, as a philosopher of science I'm interested in is how do people uh, organize science, how do people categorize science? And in that regard, I thought it was interesting to look, for example, in the University of Porto, in the Porto, how the different faculties are being uh, organized. And then in the Faculty of Science, basically, I was a bit surprised to see only a listing of uh, the, the different, I think, departments that there are um, um, uh, that comprise the field of science. So you had agriculture, applied mathematics, artificial intelligence, etc. And then there, uh, I, I found it interesting uh, in that regard that there was a distinction between biochemistry, bioinformatics, biology, and chemistry. Because other universities, for example, will uh, associate biology with bioinformatics and, and see that as one department. Some people also associate that with uh, the, the medical sciences. And what I found interesting uh, in this was that this was a, a pure listing without any um, uh, meta organization. And um, if you look into the history of uh, uh, scientific thinking and in the history of um, philosophical thinking, um, it is really philosophers that ask themselves, how can we categorize knowledge? Where can we, uh, uh, how, how, do we, how do we think about what knowledge is and how it is being categorized? And so here, for example, on the left, you see an Arbor Scientia um, uh, from Ramon Lo, and on the right, you see uh, a circle, uh, which was uh, something that associated with Ars Magna, which was one of the first attempts within the, the, the Middle Ages to think about what science is and how you categorize knowledge. And then uh, Hobbes, for example, um, he would um, also distinguish uh, science but he, make, he would make a distinction between natural philosophy and within civil philosophy. Uh, and then he would, um, I have to move this uh, frame again, here on the right, distinguish between primal, philosophia prima, geometry, arithmetics, astronomy, geography, etc. I'm not going to go through all of it. But what I find interesting is that um, Hobbes here, for example, as a child of his time, thinks about knowledge in the form of a tree. This is a key, this is a tree. While uh, Lul, for example, he was also thinking about trees, but not in a hierarchical way as what we see with Hobbes. And then uh, on just a Wikipedia page, for example, I was also looking into how you organize knowledge. And what I found here was another interesting uh, uh, scheme where there is a, a nested hierarchy. The hierarchy is not only a tree, it is a nested hierarchy. And this nested hierarchy says, that matter brings forth life, life brings forth mind, mind brings forth culture. So you have the physical sciences, biological sciences, psychological sciences, social sciences, etc. And so what you get here is an embedded structure, an embedded way of thinking about um, science. And so um, another way of thinking about science is thinking about it in a way of a network. So what you have here, for example, is uh, a network of how people think about complexity and of how people think about networks. Also, I'm, I'm just giving this as a mere illustration, but so here, for example, we have the evolution of a random network. Uh, then you have clusters of connectedness, of scientific impact, of vulnerability due to interconnectivity. So this is another way of thinking about how you categorize and organize um, uh, knowledge in general and science in specific. And in that regard, one of the things that I'm very interested in is um, eventually these images whereby we think about science, these images whereby we think about knowledge. Uh, if we look into uh, the history of intellectual thinking, we can find the genealogy about how people depict science, about how people think about science. And, and that in itself is something that is part of a larger uh, framework, which is cosmology thinking, where people start to define uh, how you can identify matter, space, and time, and how you can categorize matter, space, and time. And then in the history of uh, evolutionary thinking, uh, 
you see that certain of these images associate with certain periods in time. So for the ancient Greeks, for example, a lot of knowledge is being depicted into circles. So the zodiac, for example, uh, is such a circle. It is a wheel of time where through uh, people study planetary motions, where to, uh, whereby people study uh, the 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 revolution of the sun for the seasons to 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 help in the study of arc agriculture. Um, and this circular thinking is something that becomes linearized over the course of Western history. And so, for example, if you look at the introduction of Roman and Judeo-Christian thinking, uh, these, these, these circles of life and these wheels of time start to become scales of nature. And these scales of nature here, for example, you see the scale of nature of the Rhetorica Christiana is a first way whereby people, based upon the work of Aristotle, start to think about how to categorize the natural world. And so here at the bottom, you have uh, the plants followed by um, the birds, uh, first the animals, then the birds, then humans, and then several angels until on top you have um, uh, the Judeo-Christian deity. So this was a way to, to, to categorize uh, the natural order in the world. And this uh, scale of nature was something that then became the basis for natural history research. This scale of nature would then become um, uh, introduced into natural history thinking, where here, for example, you have um, uh, a linear time scale. Um, we are going to talk about that more later, but you have a linear time scale, and in this linear time scale, you start to investigate how species uh, originate, how they start to diverse, diversify. And then what happens is that you get these three models where you don't have a singular scale, a singular line uh, to, to think about how change occurs over time, but you start to have bifurcating trees. And then today, uh, again, as we saw with these images of science, these trees are being replaced by networks. And so, um, there's something here. Uh, I approve, I suppose. Somebody wants to to esta solitan gravar no computador. Okay, I'm gonna approve. There was somebody asking if they could uh, um, take me. I'm okay with that. Okay, so uh, there was a yeah, and so today you see a lot of networks, right? And so there is this transition and also a fight, especially within evolutionary biology, about how to depict evolution in general. Some people say that the tree of life needs to be replaced by a web of life, that the tree of life is insufficient to depict evolution in general because of uh, knowledge on natural gene transfer, etc. So this is like a, a broader framework in which I have uh, been thinking about how to, to, to provide an educational tool uh, to think about the evolution of evolutionary thinking. And so briefly again, to, to, to go over these scales, so examples of these scales of nature are here what you see, uh, an interpretation of the work of uh, Ramon Lul um, uh, about these scales of nature, where you have the idea that you go from inanimate matter, such as stones, to fire, to plants, to animals, to uh, humans, etc. And then this is like uh, uh, the the scale of nature of the Rhetorica Christiana, which is, uh, I think, uh, the 16th, 17th century, where you have like this idea that there is the perfect harmony uh, in the world um, and a hierarchical ordering of the world, uh, where you go, where the idea grows that you go from less to more complex beings and more perfect beings. First, they were more perfect beings. Then, around the 19th century, that idea of perfection um, uh, becomes um, more complex. Like there is a, a, a change in your argument from the idea that organisms are complex to uh, perfect or less perfect, closer or farther away from the deity, to the idea that they are more uh, complex. And that is an idea that is based upon the recognition that there is a division of labor, for example, in, in, in how organisms relate to one another. So these scales of nature then become the, the basis of um, these uh, um, scales of nature in evolutionary biology. And so here, uh, what you see here then is that um, these scales start, in the beginning, these scales of nature are ahistorical. When you see the Rhetorica Christiana, there is no time. There is no time. Um, what happens then with the introduction of the uh, geological thinking and natural history research is that you have the introduction of time thinking. 
And that time thinking first is not mathematical in kind. It is based upon words. So what you see here on the left uh, in red is the geological time scale, uh, which is um, really um, an, uh, a categorization of the earth strata as we find them. And these were given regular names, such as the Cambrian and, and the Silurian, etc. And this, what is interesting is that this geological time scale in and of itself is non-uniform. So you see that some periods are, are, are um, uh, shorter in duration and others are longer in duration. And then this geological time scale um, eventually will become uh, associated with a number line. And um, also within the geological time scale, by uh, um, recording the, the fossils found in these different earth layers, and by looking for morphological resemblances between these fossils, people will start to also deviate from this linear uh, way of thinking, and they will start to introduce these tree-like structures and then try with trees to demonstrate how species are associated with one another. And so that's when you get these uh, trees. Now, in general, um, there is this um, uh, transition going on from timelines and trees to uh, networks and unrooted trees of life. Um, Another thing that I find absolutely fascinating, and it is really something that I'm studying uh, uh, very hard right now, is that people have, in the sciences, worked so hard in dating the Earth, in dating the fossils, in dating evolution, uh, also uh, as a way to, to, to fight creationism. And now what is happening now that we know, based upon uh, mathematical research, and then we know like the age of the Earth, we know the age of species, etc., time is no longer of the essence for an evolutionary biologist today. Um, and what we see is like these, what they are calling unrooted networks. So if you make trees based upon um, uh, genetic resemblances and genetic affinities between species, um, these can be calibrated into something like a geological time scale. But most of the time, um, these resemblances are are calculated not in time per se, but based upon uh, how many genes you share, for example, in common with another species. And so in that regard, what you get is like structures like these, where there is no time, where there is no root, where there is in essence no, um, or, or perhaps a different way of thinking about time, because that's also something I have to again move these, um, the people watching online. But here on the right, for example, what you see here is a, a, a tree of um, of life uh, where uh, the scholars that did that said, well, what you see here is that all of these, at the end of this uh, unrooted tree, all of these species today are alive. So what we see here is again, uh, a, a radiation in a way of time. So some people say there is time because everybody here at the end of these uh, lineages are alive. So this is a different way again of thinking about time. So that is something that I, I, I just want to say as a broader context um, uh, where, where uh, we currently have like this division between trees and networks. And so what, what, what uh, uh, I have figured out so far is that trees really have a Cartesian tracking in space and time of how matter, in this case species, evolve. And they are linear and multilinear, and they have a time consistency, and they focus on vertical descent. And so what you have here is phylogenetics. It's the study of the past. Networks, on the other hand, they uh, introduce some kind of multidimensional scaling, which is nonlinear, not necessarily time consistent. And uh, it focuses on also, as we will see, this is important for what I'm going to say later, it focuses not so much on how life evolves over time, but on how life interacts with other life um, within ecology and during reticulate evolution and during ontogeny. And that is something that is no longer a study of the past, but a study of, 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 space, of space and of uh, what I started to call the extended present. And so this is something that I wanted to say before I start to talk about like the main part of my talk, which is this flower of evolution, because it is um, um, uh, from within that background that I started to think about new ways of, of depicting the evolution of evolutionary thinking. 
And so now um, um, we're going to look into this uh, uh, structure in more detail. I need to move this again. In more detail, because um, with every school, um, with every uh, paradigm, there um, uh, are different ways of thinking about evolution and there have been different discoveries uh, and methodologies introduced to think about um, evolution. And so in this regard, now we're going to go uh, through these um, one by one. I wonder if I can minimize this. Ah, well, okay. Well, if you really die. Okay. So Darwinism, uh, classic Darwinism, uh, as introduced by Darwin himself in The Origin of Species, says that there is a scarcity of resources, which is a hypothesis. Some people today say there was never a scarcity of resources. But so that's how he starts. He says there is a scarcity of resources, which causes a struggle for existence. Uh, organisms demonstrate variation. That variation is a subject of natural and sexual selection. Um, those that uh, are fit and that are naturally selected are able to pass on their variation through inheritance to the next generation. And that leads to gradual uh, adaptation and descent with modification. That's basically the idea of Darwin, of, of evolution by means of natural selection. And um, uh, in that regard, uh, a famous image of him, uh, two famous images of him are this I think diagram and also this um, diagram that he introduced in the origin of species that uh, scholars today identify as a tree of life. But Darwin, however, never called this a tree of life. Darwin in his chapter four makes use of the metaphor of a tree of life. He also introduces the concept of a coral of life, uh, but he himself never introduced this diagram as uh, a tree of life. For him, this is a hypothetical way to think about how species will diversify uh, over time. So for example, you have here a group of organisms that over time, uh, and interestingly, um, you see these horizontal lines, and these horizontal lines for him each represent a thousand years, ten thousand years. Um, these lines, you have already the idea of uniformity, uh, different from the geological time scale that we saw, that was non uniform. Here, he introduces uh, a, a Roman numeral timeline, but so these time, these, these lines each represent ten thousand years, and so he has the idea that over that life will gradually. Um, over this timeline, start to diversify up to the point that new species evolve. And so people then think about this image and start to uh, um, incorporate this image, especially Hackel, for example, will start to um, uh, then draw actual trees of life uh, as we know them today. And so this is Darwinism. Then uh, the modern synthesis um, arises because Darwin never really knew uh, the source of variation. He had a lot of ideas about it, but none uh, entirely correct. And so Darwinism uh, uh, went through a rough time and it was almost rejected by the scientific community until uh, at the dawn of the previous century, uh, Mendel's hereditary laws uh, were rediscovered. Uh, when people started to think about um, um, factors at that time, which associated with certain uh, behavioral traits and, and, and morphological traits. And um, Mendel as well, Mendel was, was a, a religious scholar. He did not uh, endorse any idea of uh, evolution. He was just looking into how traits get passed on and he found there a ratio of uh, dominant traits being three times more uh, passed on than uh, um, non-dominant traits and recessive traits. But so he didn't know about genes neither. He didn't know he called it, they called it factors. And um, so um, these factors later were uh, um, synthesized with genetic theory. And uh, people also started to realize that genes can mutate, that they can go, that they can undergo mutation, mutations. And then um, people start to investigate using mathematics how, um, uh, what genes are and how genes can become passed on over populations. And with that, you have a shift from the organism that is the one that carries these um, uh, traits to populations that are the ones that distribute the traits over time. 
And so here you find this, this uh, uh, complex thinking uh, where people then also start to look into uh, concepts of genetic drift and also in, in that regard start to think about what are species, how do we define species, and they also look into trends. I'm not uh, personally going to talk about all of that uh, individually, but you can ask me questions about that. But what is interesting here is that with the introduction of the modern synthesis, people start to think about what are called units and levels of selection. And this is also something, again, uh, if you have hardcore biology on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have philosophy of biology. And uh, here, philosophy of biology is, is very much, has been very much engaged in what is called the units and levels of selection debate. Um, so for Darwin, it was very simple. Natural selection acts from the environment onto the organism. Now, with the introduction of genetic thinking, people start to realize that organisms are brought forth by genes. So you have to have this micro level. Uh, and organisms bring forth species, so you have this macro level. What you have because of that is a new way of thinking hierarchically about genes, uh, organisms, and species, which really reduces micro, meso, and macroevolutionary outlooks, which were already present with the Greeks. And this, in a way, also this idea of genes, organisms, and species is a reintroduction of the another division of the sciences, the, the, the division between the inorganic, the organic, and the superorganic. And so what you start to have here is a kind of hierarchical thinking uh, about how you conceptualize life. And so you end up with this structure where the focal level is the organism, and you have to go down one level to the lower level from genes to see how genes bring forth organisms, and then how organisms bring forth species. So you get hierarchical thinking. Now, this inorganic, organic, superorganic kind of thinking is also something that is very successful, and it is also something that pushes the modern synthesis to also try and implement natural selection thinking into cultural evolution studies, which at that time are called the superorganic. Gruber, for example, was one of the scholars who said that um, uh, Culture and society is something that is above uh, biology. So you have inorganic matter, you have the organic, the organism, and then populations, biology, etc. But when you want to talk about culture, he said you have to level up in the hierarchy and look into what he called the superorganic. Um, and here, effectively, this is also uh, where then Kruber in anthropology. Kruber is one of the the founders of American anthropology, but he was uh, with the European descent. And he drew a line there, and he said the difference between biology and culture is that if you look into the tree of life of biology, on the left, you have diversification, vertical evolution. If you look into culture, he said, what you have there is you have cultural contact, language borrowing, uh, and you have a lot of reticulations, you have a lot of network-like structures borrowing between the existing lineages, between cultures, uh, because of warfare or colonization or just like cultural contact, multiculturalism. And so this was a reason for Kruber to say that cultural evolution is distinct from uh, evolution as it occurs by means of natural selection. And to say that evolutionary thinking was not applicable to study social cultural evolution. Um, and so then the modern synthesis starts to diversify and it starts to develop further into uh, these micro, meso, and macroevolutionary schools. So the microevolutionary school studies genes, the mesoevolutionary school, school studies organisms, and the macroevolutionary school studies species and above uh, species phenomena. Um, and so if you look into microevolutionary research, there you have the foundation of biochemistry and molecular genetics which, as I told you in the beginning, at this university is something that is separated from biology, which is also interesting because there are a lot of universities that are doing that these days that are separating bioinformatics and biochemistry and molecular genetics from evolution theory. And evolution in that regard is something that is being pushed to metaphysical thinking and philosophical thinking, while the hardcore scientist that studies uh, uh, molecular and bio bio biochemistry Questions: Does he need evolution or not to understand how life uh, is? It's 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 a debate. So you have uh, here the discovery of um, uh, genetic material, and then what you have there um, are um, um, 
first of all, like uh, omics and sequencing, you have an enormous arsenal of methodologies that develop to study um, genes and how they evolve through time. Uh, and in that regard, people also use uh, genes to uh, introduce molecular clocks to, to, to time evolution based upon genetic diversions, which is something entirely different than timing evolution based upon the geological time scale or timing it based upon a numerical timeline. Uh, when you um, uh, study life based upon genetic diversions, that then needs to be calibrated into a geological time scale. Um, and then people need to find uh, um, what what is similar there, um, which not always, which which often gives like difficulties uh, in theories because um, um, uh, gene trees, for example, do not always match with the geological time scale. So that gives a debate in the sciences. Then in mesoevolution, um, because of the study of genes and the introduction of genes and the success of uh, population genetics and the advances that are made in gene research, um, people start to forget about the organism. So then uh, a group of scholars starts to say, but what about the organism? We cannot forget about the organism. Uh, but so in that regard, people are starting to think about multiple levels of selection. So the idea is, is gene, are genes the only true survivors of uh, evolution, as Dawkins, for example, said? Genes are the only ultimate units of selection. Or can we also understand organisms as units of selection? And just thinking about how genes can be a unit of selection brings forth multi-level selection debate. Because if you say that genes are indeed the true unit of evolution, then you can ask yourself the question, does that gene evolve? at the level of the genome, at the level of the proteome, at the level of the cells and the tissues, at the level of organs and systems, at the level of organisms, populations, or species. So just thinking about a gene as a unit of evolution brings forth a question of, well, where exactly is it that these genes evolve? And in that regard, you have a reconceptualization of what the environment is, because natural selection is something that acts upon the organism from the environment onto the organism. Okay, if natural selection works onto the gene, then where does it do, do that? In the gene, the protein, the cells, the tissues, etc. What you have there is a reinterpretation of what an environment is, and organisms themselves become an environment. Bluentin, for example, called that the internalization of selection because the body itself, where you have in many cells a gene silencing, for example, some genes uh, once once they 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 um, uh, are, are assigned to a certain uh, organ, they will shut down all the other genes not involved in that organ. And so you have gene silencing, for example, you can understand that as a form of selection that occurs at the level of the cell. But then you have a reinterpretation of what the environment is. Uh, if you go to macroevolution, there people also start to, do, to, to think more about above organismal uh, phenomena. And in that regard, uh, especially uh, a group uh, um, in uh, America is, is uh, starting to question the, the tempo and the rate of evolution. And in that regard, also this classic tree of um, uh, life. So now Zeldris and Stephen G. Gould, for example, uh, introduced a theory of punctuated equilibria, which questions the tempo and the rate of evolution. So for Darwin, evolution was a gradual process. Um, that occurred over generations through time. And the further he advanced in his thinking, more and more time was needed for him to get to the complex organisms that we found, find today. Now, um, Stephen de Gould and uh, uh, Niles Eldridge, they look into several species, into the fossil record, and um, they start to question the idea of this gradualness. Darwin would say when there is... Um, when we don't find fossils in the fossil record, he said we need to assume that there are intermediates and the fossil record is incomplete. If we don't find them, the fossils disappear because that's what fossils also do. A lot of fossils, they just literally turn to dust, you know, they just disappear. Uh, what they do is, is uh, question this and they say, when we find gaps in the fossil record, we are taking this as data. We are seeing this as real. And so we are going to model evolution based upon the gaps that we find. And then they come up with this pattern of, of punctuated equilibria, uh, 
where they find that in certain species, not all species, but for example, in Facopsrana, um, you have species that um, demonstrate long periods of stasis where there is morphologically no evolution happening, no change in, in the fossils whatsoever. And then all of a sudden, around species and events, you have these morphological changes and these rapid um, morphological changes that occur. Uh, and what is more, these rapid changes in morphology are associated with different kinds of environments. So uh, in the evolution of Rana, for example, it is um, uh, changing sea levels of marginal sea and uh, epiteric ep sea levels that cause for rapid evolutionary change in these species. But sometimes for millions of years, sometimes five million years, these Hakopsrana, they did not morpholo morphologically demonstrate any kind of change. Now, the geneticists would say, yeah, but that's because you look at the fossils, you don't know about the genes. Like genes are supposed to mutate, there are mutation rates, like there are studies, mathematical models that say uh, how many mutations there should be per generation, etc. But now also on a molecular level, it has been proven that punctuated equilibria uh, is a fact. We can also prove it genetically. That's work by Mark Pago. So that's macroevolution. But so um, here again, that was like a bit more like hardcore uh, biology, but then what do the philosophers there do? Well, uh, the philosophers in that regard help to think with science about the implications of these changing hierarchical views of how we understand life and how we understand and, and depict it and model it. And so, for example, if you say that genes bring forth organisms that bring forth species, uh, this is something that then in, in more theoretical biology and philosophy of biology associates with questions of individuality, natural kinds and major transitions, and also the nature of nested hierarchies. So, uh, for example, if you say that genes bring forth organisms and organisms bring forth species, then the first and obvious question is, what is a species? Is that real? Is that something only real in name? Or can you say that a species has existence? Some people say you can delineate a species in time because it has a beginning, a duration, and an ending in time. So you can make a circle around a group of individuals and you can say that is a species. But then people will say, but yes, but you draw a circle around a group of individuals and you call it a species, and then that species turns into another species. So where does the identity and the individuality of one species end and the identity and the individuality of another species begin? And then you have philosophy. And then you also don't have an answer, but it's a question. Anyway, so another thing that you have in that regard is that you have to start to think about these hierarchies also as an embedded structure. So uh, when you say that genes uh, bring forth organisms and organism species, you have an embedded structure, but also you can go further in that. So an organism is made up of cells, cells are made up of chromosomes, chromosomes are made up of pairs, pairs of what, of, of DNA, etc. So you can also keep going further and further and further until an atomic and even a subatomic level if you want. And also on the other side, you can go further and further and further. But then the question again is like, where is there an organism? Where is there an individual? And where, wh what are you drawing circles around? People also in that regard start to debate, for example, the division of labor. Um, um, is a piece of DNA, for example, a piece of me, or is it a piece of my cell? How much is the cell a piece of me? Every three weeks, my cells are completely changing. So, so where is my continuity as an individual? These are questions that, that are brought forth by thinking about evolution in this way. And so in that regard, um, one of the questions uh, that was uh, hotly debated um, in biology was the distinction that was being made between upward causation and downward causation. So when you say that things bring forth organisms that bring forth species, um, you're looking into a, a kind of upward causation. Genes are the cause for organisms, organisms are the cause for species. So you're looking into natural history, you're looking into how genes afford the evolution of organisms and how organisms afford the evolution of, of species. So you're looking into temporal chain. Then people start to ask whether there is something like downward causation, whether an organism can influence how genes evolve or whether a species can influence how the organism evolves. And when you ask those questions, you're looking into 
ecology, ontology, and developmental biology. And you're looking into how organisms, for example, constrain the further evolution of genes and how species can constrain the further evolution of organisms, for example. And in this regard, this is something that is very much studied now uh, with gene regulatory networks, for example, with epigenetics, where people investigate the influence from the environment and from uh, lifestyles, for example, upon genes. So we know, for example, in the environment, there are a lot of carcino gene, uh, carcinogens, things that cause cancer that will affect our DNA. So if we look upon that, we don't look into how life evolves over time. We look into how existing life is set within the environment and what the impact of that environment is onto the organism. So that is downward causation. Uh, and then you have this other school, uh, which is ecology. And ecology is also very interesting because, um, eco so Darwin said you have the organism and the environment, right? And the organism is selected by the environment. So there is selection from the environment onto the organism. And then uh, in the 70s, Louis, um, uh, Van Valen, Lee Van Valen uh, comes around and he says, yes, but if you look into this uh, environment, that environment, he says, is also made up of other organisms. So if you want to understand ecology, he says, you have to look into organism-organism relationships, which is also a genius idea and it's also something that completely turned around thinking uh, because the environment, like at that time, was, was more conceived of as something physical. But now Van Velen says, well, the environment uh, where organisms evolve and where they are selected from is other organisms. And so then you get uh, questions of, uh, of how organisms relate to one another. And so you have uh, uh, predator prey. So the hare is eaten by the fox, but the fox is eaten by, um, I actually don't know exactly what this is, like an eagle or a, 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 um, I don't know the English or a bird. So. And um, so you have like these these organism organism relationships. And here again, this is interesting. That's why I started with my long introduction. Uh, all of us, when we went to school, we were taught about food chains. And so uh, here, for example, you have like the food chain. The the shark is at the top of the food chain. The shark eats a smaller shark, which eats you know some sunfish, etc. And so you have like this scale, this chain of uh, beings. Today, when people start to 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 map and depict these kinds of uh, ecological relationships there also you are moving away from this this chain and you are getting network typologies so then again so what's going on there why why is it a network and why is the network better uh, at depicting evolution and so in that regard we uh, we are advancing well we are um coming to the part where i have to explain what the blue is in this flower of evolution is also has a meaning this blue is something that today associates with eco evo devo theory, which is ecological developmental, uh, evolutionary developmental biology, uh, which is a rising paradigm, eco evo devo. Um, yeah, a rising paradigm, eco evo devo, that tries to break free from the modern synthesis by introducing theories that combine ecology, evolution, and development. And so this is a rising paradigm within uh, evolutionary uh, biology. It started with um, Pigliucci and Muller, who uh, in the beginning only talked about evo-devo. They were very interested in, in uh, studying gene regulatory networks and epigenetics. And so they were doing evo-devo. And then that evo-devo, so here, variation inheritance natural selection was basically Darwinism. And then uh, gene mutation and heredity, et cetera, was the modern synthesis. And then what they wanted to introduce was evo devo thinking, where you have all these other um, uh, ideas, such as niche construction, for example, and epigenetic inheritance that they wanted to introduce. And me, I was never happy with this image. And so that's why I introduced the flower of evolution, because I think this image is insatisfactory. Um, and one of the reasons why it was insatisfactory is because eco evo devo theory in itself also does not take into account reticulate evolution. And reticulate evolution is uh, evolution as it occurs by means of hybridization, lateral gene transfer, infective heredity, symbiosis, symbiogenesis, and it associates with theorizing about holobiomes. Okay, so um, natural selection theory is a theory that explains how species diversify over time, okay? 
any kind of uh, reticulate evolution studies how lineages that have evolved uh, interact with one another and how they can uh, exchange uh, information and matter and energy amongst one another. So um, let me see. Um, yeah. So what you have here is um, on the right, for example, an image of Doolittle that says if you look into the tree of life, um, what you see is that especially bacteria, for example, they can very easily exchange genes amongst one another. So for humans to exchange genes amongst one another, you have to have sex with a person from the opposite sex, uh, from the opposite sex, and you have to produce uh, an individual where half of your genes are going to be passed on. But then in the cell uh, of the woman, the egg cell, there is also mitochondria, for example. And that mitochondria, all the mitochondria in your cell come from your mother only. They are passed on through the egg cell alone. Now, research shows, and this is the image that you see here on the top, um, that mitochondria, which are part of your cells that you get from your mother, once used to be free-living bacteria. And so, two billion years ago, uh, free-living bacteria entered some of the first eukaryotic cells, the cells with nucleus, and they lost their identity, they lost their individuality, and they became organelles, little cell bodies inside of these cells. And so you can explain that by natural selection. You have to assume that at one point, cells started to, to exchange um, information with one another. Some, sometimes they just started to eat one another, and that resulted into the engulfment of, of foreign bodies. And today, for example, we know that uh, um, symbiosis and symbiogenesis research is not a phenomenon that is uh, reduced to two billion years ago. Uh, our gut, for example, or our skin or our lungs is full, full, full of microbes. And so they don't uh, form part of the of the the, the center of our cells or, or the cytoplasm of our cells, but they form part of us. And so in that regard, we are not an individual. We, together with our microbiome, are a holobiome. That is something that associates with that. So that is reticulate evolution. And reticulate evolution is something that cannot be explained not by Darwinism, not by the modern synthesis, and also not, I think, by Ecoevodevo theory. I think that there is some overlap there, but this is also something that, again, the philosophers are debating. But I think that reticulate evolution is, is strong enough to be a school in and of itself. And so um, this is something that I do then from within a group that is called the Third Way of Evolution, uh, where... Um, uh, what Noble, for example, uh, does here is he says, we, we cannot like argue against any of these schools and that is very important. So you have like this micro, meso, macro evolutionary school, etc. None of them are wrong. That is very interesting. None of them are wrong. All of them have proven scientifically, mathematically, uh, modeling wise, what they are saying. So we need to come to terms with the fact that all of these theories of evolution are true that none of them is better than the other, and that we have to have something what he calls biological relativity. It is the need to recognize that evolution occurs by multiple mechanisms and that there is epistemic pluralism. And so it also means that all of us have to like get along better because within the history of science, there have been huge debates about whether reticulate evolution was true or microgenetic evolution was true. And today we, we just need to embrace all of these theories and, and then um, um, look into um, how we can combine these into an even bigger evolutionary period. And so um, let me see my time. I don't have so much time anymore. I just want to say that I uh, myself have been very active in um, symbiosis and in symbiogenesis research. And uh, I've also drawn uh, parallels, uh, especially with social cultural evolution, because you remember the tree of life of Kruber. Kruber said, Cultural evolution cannot be explained uh, by cultural. Cu sorry, culture cannot be explained by evolutionary theory because you don't accept reticulation. But we now know that reticulation is part and parcel of uh, biological evolution. So there is no more reason to not assume that cultural evolution also does not exist and that it exists through reticulate evolution. So um, these are some references of mine. If you're interested, you you can uh, look into that. 
Uh, I want to go uh, a bit more into uh, the hardcore philosophical parts of this. So, um, so far, I've, I've uh, tried to convince you uh, of, of several um, shifts in thinking uh, within the history of thinking. And so we have gone from the idea of classical physics, where you have a, a distinction between the inorganic, the organic, and the superorganic. And here, People think about causality as something that is external, that is imposed upon uh, entities. Darwin had that a bit also by saying that the environment imposes itself onto the organism and the environment selects the organism. So you have like environmental selection from the outside onto the organism. But with the modern synthesis, this organism becomes distinguished between genes, organisms, and species. And so uh, people start to debate upward causation, but also downward causation. Now, one of the things that reticulate evolution shows is that neither upward nor downward causation, although important, very important, is insufficient to understand reticulate evolution. Again, because we get like these kinds of network-like structures. And so in that regard, one of the things that I've been introducing uh, personally into the debate is I have launched the concept of reticulate causation. When you look into how um, genes from one organism become transferred to genes of another organism, uh, which is something, for example, that you see here. So here you have a bacteriophage injecting DNA into an E. coli bacteria. Um, and then that uh, DNA can become um, part of, of uh, the bacterial chromosome or the cell can burst, it can die because the, the virus will start to, to multiply. Uh, and in that process, there can also be gene transfer uh, when that bacteria starts to um, um, die out. Anyway, so the short person is there can be genes that can be transferred between different lineages. Now, when you start to model that, you have genes of one lineage and genes of another. When you start to model that, you have to draw a line between different lineages. When you look into hybridization, when you have an organism of one plant species hybridizing with an organism of another plant species, you have to draw a line between different lineages. When you look into how genes from one organism enter into another species, you have to draw these network-like structures. As you get here, something that I call um, reticulate causation. So what that does, what does that mean? That means that uh, thinking linearly or thinking uh, nestedly, thinking hierarchies, hierarchies as a nested hierarchy is not sufficient because you don't only get one bigger, bigger organism. You also have to look into how um, there are interactions, how you have reticulate causation. And then you have to have, um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but you have to have a, a kind of an interactional hierarchy where you have multidirectionality and where you have reticulate interactions between units belonging to different levels of the same or different hierarchies. So this is one way of saying you have to think in networks. It's very simple, like you have to think in networks. You cannot think in trees alone. You have to think in networks. You cannot think uh, in, 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 in hierarchies being embedded. Hierarchies can also be the result of reticulate causation. Uh, and so one way where you can implement that is um, when you look into holobiont formation. So uh, as said, we are not individuals. We are made up of ourselves, of our organs, of ourselves, which is an embedded structure. My genes for my cells, my cells for my organs, my organs for my body. That's true. That's an acid hierarchy. But on top of that, on my skin, in my gut, on my hair, in my eyes, everywhere, I have microbes with me. Millions of them, and all of us together are this holobiont, which is a new individual uh, and also at the same time a new habitable zone of life. And this is very interesting again, because with this internalization of selection also, here you also have um, the recognition that an organism is in itself an ecology. We are not just one being, we are an ecosystem. If you take into account our microbiome and our virion, et cetera, that evolves with us. And so, um, how are you guys doing? Are you tired? Because I could like go on for like 10 more minutes or I could, could end it here. What, what do you think? 
more? Okay, so let's do it. So another thing that I've been introducing there is um, a concept of self-causation. So we have had upward causation, downward causation, reticular causation, and there is also the concept of self-causation, which is a question of how the focal level in a hierarchy can maintain itself over time. And so this is also something that uh, uh, is studied within the cognitive sciences, and, and it, I think it's very much studied also within people with AMLA that are uh, very much into uh, for recognition and cognitive thinking, where you have um, the idea introduced by Maturana and Varela that there is some kind of autopoiesis, that there is some kind of self-maintaining system, self-regulating system. And so that is a question that asks about self-causation. So we have had upward causation, we have had downward causation, reticular causation, and then there is self-causation. And in a recent publication in the Biological Journal of the Minnesota Society, which is something that we did with the third wave of evolution, it's an entire special issue, it's very interesting, where people have started to think about the question of teleonomy again. Teleonomy, people didn't like it before, now it's back and um, one way of thinking about self-organization and teleonomy is by thinking about it in terms of self-causation. And I have in that uh, paper um, started to think about self-causation as a problem of how things maintain again over time. Because one of the things that was being forgotten in these structures, upward, downward, and also reticulate, is a question of time. So how do you add time to this equation? And then you get like these gray structures. How do genes maintain over time? Well, very simply, genes replicate. So they bring forth themselves very easily. Like you, you see that here, for example, that is the hypercycle of Manfred Eigen. Like the short version is genes bring forth genes over time. Organisms also bring forth organisms over time. A lot of plants, for example, uh, just uh, evolve uh, by cloning in a way. So they, they, they bring forth more of themselves. For sexually reproducing organisms, you can say an organism never fully brings forth itself, but it brings forth other organisms. But then to explain, for example, how humans make babies, you have to realize that you have an organism of one lineage with one history and an organism with another history that have to reproduce sexually. Uh, and in the sexual reproduction, you have the genes being brought forth. So here you see that to understand something like that, you don't only have um, uh, upward causation, you also have reticulate causation between the mother and the father uh, that then bring forth the genes, but then the genes start bringing forth the organism that then potentially can lead to uh, new species. So here you see like this complexity that uh, associates with, with thinking about how things uh, evolve over time. And then species also, the question is, do species bring forth other species? Well, yes, that's what that was the, the foundation of the modern synthesis, species speciate. But then again, to understand species speciation, you have to understand how species are brought forth by organisms, how organisms are brought forth by genes, and you have this entire system. So you need to start to think about this system as a whole. And then the question is, well, is there some kind of self-causation there? And that is what I call the duality of self-causation. It is a question about individuality, about agency, whether any element in such a hierarchical system is able to take control of the entire system. I don't have a question. I, I have the question, but I don't have an answer to it. And it brings us right back to philosophy because it brings us right back to the question of Plato about whether there is some kind of steers person, whether there is some kind of captain of the ship that gives direction to uh, how evolution occurs. And I think that is at the heart of the question of teleonomy. And it is a way of formulating the question. But as I am a philosopher, I formulate questions, but I do not answer them. <laughs> so um, that's it. I also wanted to say, but I don't have time for that uh, today, but if people are interested, this structure between micro, meso, and macro evolution is entire flower of evolution is also a way to think about how people have uh, talk, uh, thought about social, cultural, and cognitive evolution. And so I have uh, implemented that flower also upon uh, the study of symbolic evolution. And this is a reference uh, for that. And with that, I come to the end of my uh, presentation. And I thank you very much for your time.
Let me open the people like this. Oh, yes, I put by them. Yes. See. Okay. Well, you can have genes. So I, I have, maybe the question is, what, what kind of foundation are you thinking? How 